Well, good evening, everybody. I've had a chance to talk to the people in the sanctuary. Um, hope you've had a good day. Nice sunny day. A little windy outside today, but all told, it's a good day. Hope you at home are doing okay. My name is Sean. I'm the lead pastor here at Faith Community. I'm glad that you are with us uh, live. Many of you are at home watching this, and maybe if you're going to watch this later on this week. Um, so it's just good to have you. And um, I know Wednesday nights are oftentimes just physically and emotionally, man, you're like, oh, I'm beat, but I'm glad you're with us. And what we're going to do tonight is just continue with a discussion. We started this last Wednesday night, and we, uh, we have the message title called The Cure for an Unsatisfied Life. And you know, that's kind of one of those things that you and I just have to really uh, be honest about. Um, you know, how satisfied are we? You know, how, how is our faith, how is our life uh, directing us towards having a satisfied life? Are we just always anxious or are we, you know, kind of lurching? We're, we're, you know, we're just not settled. And maybe you found in your life, as what I'm trying to do, is to eliminate those periods in our life where we're lurching after things that we know will never satisfy us, but we just, we're not settled enough just to know, Lord, you will supply what I need. And I want to uh, be able to talk tonight, uh, honestly, about uh, a few things uh, as a second part. So last week was part one. This week will be part two, the cure for an unsatisfied life, part two. Is that okay with you all? And for the sake of those, whenever you have uh, divided messages, you oftentimes have to just make sure that everybody knows where you're at. So let me just take uh, two, three minutes to make sure that we're all on the same page for those. And we're glad if you're viewing with us tonight for the very first time. So I didn't mean that in any derogatory sense, but obviously you don't know what we talked about last week. We, we talked about the fact that, and we used two metaphors for bread and for water, both of which are needed things that we need for our life. But in addition to the physical dimension to that, we looked at the Old Testament and we looked at how both bread and water were promised to the people of God and uh, Jesus picks up that theme in the New Testament. The Old Testament kind of makes way for the New. And Jesus fulfills the Old Testament. And Jesus picked up those same metaphors. And he said, I am the bread of life. And that he who eats of me, he who uh, follows me will never be hungry. And he also says, I'm the living water. I'm the water of life. Said different ways, but he uses that terminology, water. And he says, you know, to many different people, but in one case, he is talking to a woman who you can see throughout her life is lurching after. I mean, she's been in multiple relationships. She's just searching for things. Jesus says, you know, if you drink of the water that I give to you, you'll never be thirsty. And she keeps thinking about, well, Lord, you know, what about this physical water? And Jesus is saying, no, that when you come and rely upon me, I will well up within you living water that will quench the deep thirsts of your life. And I think that's a good way to kind of close this whole section off because, you know, we're going to be unsatisfied as long as we try to fill the God-shaped hole in our life with earthly things. Whenever we take creative things, whenever we take good things and try to make them exclusive things, in our life, it'll never work because God made us to know him and only he can really satisfy what we really need in our life. And that is for a sense in which we know the one who made us, that we can have peace and we can have fulfillment in knowing and learning, unfortunately, oftentimes through the school of hard knocks, that the things of this life won't do what only Jesus can do for us. Amen to that. And we oftentimes have to just keep coming back to that over and over and over again. And we started off last week with Psalm 42, and it just says, and I'll say this to you, as the deer pants for streams of water, so my soul. And the soul is what makes us a human being. And, you know, he says, my, my, my humanness, my humanness pants for you, O God. My soul thirsts for God, the living God. That is what all of us should say in our own heart of hearts, that, Lord, I need you. My soul thirsts after you. 
And we oftentimes just look at, you know, the things of life that are promised. And if we don't watch out, we just lurch after them and we find out, you know what, this has no real ability to meet the deep needs of my life. So that's kind of where we left off. And what i like to be able to do tonight and, uh, you know, start early, everybody online. If you have questions, if you have prayer concerns, please uh, let me know you're with us. First of all, let us know you're with us. And then if you have any questions or prayer concerns, please get them in early. I don't like to cut off our time. Oftentimes, oftentimes I cut off our live stream and then I go five or ten minutes later and I have a prayer concern that somebody has shared. I, I would like to be able to know that and pass it on to everybody here so we can know what's going on in your life. So let us know what's up and we'll go on. What I'd like to be able to do if we can is just tonight do two things if I can. Let me give you some pastoral help to find deep satisfaction in our life. Um, you know, whenever you start listing things, this is not going to work unless we begin to put it into practice. So I don't want you just to take these five points and go, oh, I guess that's not. None of this works unless you're willing to say, Lord, that's what I need. And hopefully one of these will hit you and you'll be able to say, that's what I need in my next portion of my spiritual life. That's what I need to concentrate on to find satisfaction. And then I want to talk about our, our future satisfaction in Jesus. You know, a lot of these things are speculative. You know, people ask me all the time, what's the future look like? Uh, in biblical terms, doctrinal terms, it's called eschatology, the study of last things. What's it look like? I'm just going to jump to the very end tonight and let you kind of see what the end, uh, when God comes to bring his new heavens and his earth together, what that looks like. Because, again, the Bible is a whole. And what we've looked at through the Old Testament with its references to water and to bread is coming to its final and complete fulfillment in Revelation chapter 20 and 21. Because as we look there, we're like, this, this all makes sense. John knows what was in the Old Testament, and he brings it all to a culmination, and we're going to get there in just a second. Okay, let me just list five things for us tonight. And uh, I put this lesson together, message together, about two weeks ago. And some of these things you just say, okay, that's not really relevant to me. That's fine. Uh, by that, you're not saying I don't need it, but okay, I, I'm, I know that. And, um, you know, thank you for sharing that, but I, I need something else. That's fine. I hope one of these five things is something you could hang your hat on and say, this is something that I really need to look at. If you're at home, feel free to just, you know, let me know what's going on if you have any questions or a comment with it. First thing is this. If you want to have satisfaction, you've got to know and admit your story. And you've got to be honest with yourself and say to yourself, Sean, and you put your name in there. Where is it that you lurch after? Where is it that you're unsatisfied? And it could be a wide variety of things in your relationships, in your friendships. I mean, it could be with the people at church. Maybe you're just unsatisfied with your spiritual life altogether. Maybe you're dissatisfied in life in general. You're just, and I don't mean this in any wrong way, I think we all go periods of time where we go through, you know, periods where we're just kind of crotchety and kind of like, you know, uh, you know, got off on the wrong side of the bed. I don't know how, I don't know what you want to say in that regard, but you surely don't want that to become the way that you live your life, where you're just short on the stick. Somebody says something, you're just like, you know, and that becomes an issue for us. So you have to be honest and, and own your life and own your experiences and be forthright with where you've, you've seen in your life this lack of satisfaction in Jesus. You, you, have to, you have to be brutally honest with yourself. And, you know, I just think that's where we have to start. Know and admit to your story. Because Jesus says, everyone who drinks this earthly physical water will be thirsty again. Well, what is that that you're thirsting after that you're not getting anything or any uh, satisfaction through? Anybody want to... What else could we be dissatisfied with? Anybody just want to share? Work, right? You could be dissatisfied with your work, your employment. And the only problem with it is, it's almost like marriage, isn't it? A lot of people are dissatisfied with their marriage, and they think they got to go on to another one. And what happens is, if you don't get the deep needs of your life met, 
you're going to go into another marriage or another job, and you're going to be like, this didn't make me any better than I was before, you know? So that's the reason why it's so, it's so uh, if I say brutally honest, I mean, you, you have to be very frank. You know yourself, right? I mean, we can put up all these facades, but you know in your life where those senses of which I'm not satisfied here. Second is cultivate a desire to trust Jesus, not just for forgiveness, but for life. And so oftentimes we just kind of uh, innately or by habit think, well, Jesus can forgive me, but he really doesn't know much about my life. And I just want to let you know he is life. He knows your life. He can help you in your life right where it is. And he's the master of life, not just the forgiver of sins. And we need to continue to come back and say, Jesus, you can help me because you know my life. And we're only going to find satisfaction in the level upon which we're willing to trust Jesus with our life. If our life is over there somewhere and just our churchy life is over here, right? I'm not trying to be too sarcastic, but sometimes that's the way it is. We just, well, I'm going to go to church or I'm going to take care of my spiritual needs. We go over there and do that. No, 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 no. It's our life. We don't don't separate those two. Jesus walks with you and Jesus goes with you into your work, doesn't he? He goes with us wherever we go, and he's able to help us in those needs. And I just want us to keep that in mind and let us know that Jesus gives me life. Because he says that, doesn't he? I have come to give you abundant forgiveness. That's not what he said, is it? But we oftentimes, with our own limited understanding about what Jesus wants to do, that's how we read it. So I'll live my life until I really screw up my life, and then God's going to forgive me. That's kind of the way many Christians believe. But why don't we say to ourselves, Jesus, you are my life, so I'm going to trust you with my life and begin to see you work in my life before <laughs> before I need your forgiveness. I mean, we need God's grace all the time, but you understand my point. We just think we can kind of do our own thing, and that, but Jesus is going to forgive me. And he will, and thank God for that. But don't you want to trust him? You know, don't you want to trust him with your life? Because he said, I have come to give you a full life. Trust him with that. That's where I'm at. Lord, you, you have promised me that. It, it echoes what David said in Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. And, you know, Jesus comes and says, I have come to give you that fullness. You won't lack anything. I'm going to give you a full life. Anybody want to share anything about that? Any lessons learned, any hard knocks, or any ways in which that helps you to kind of see what's going on in your own life? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Someone has said here, for those who are watching, even with her financial stewardship, that she began to trust God to actually tithe. And she has come to the point of realizing she can trust God with that, that what she gives up will be fully given back to her or the 90% or the money that she has will be multiplied in such a way that we can trust that it's going to be better off than what it was before. And uh, that's, I didn't even think about that. That's a, an excellent point to be had. We can trust God in all these areas of our life. Okay, so no one admit your story. Be frank and honest about your life. Second, desire to trust Jesus, not just for your forgiveness, but for your life itself. And third, continual dependence, daily dependence building that habit in your life of when you get up in the morning, you say, I need you, Lord, today. Because we got to that point last week where just like the Israelite people were given daily bread, we can pray the same Lord's Prayer and say, Jesus, give me the daily bread that I need today. Amen to that? You will supply what I need for this day. Help me to build a trusting 
uh, expectancy in this day for you. You're going to meet the needs of my life. It's just not for physical bread. It's for whatever we need for that day, Lord. You've promised that you're going to be sufficient for this day. And that becomes a way. And I'm not saying you have to do that. Uh, I'm building that. I, I, I don't like to talk about my life as if it's somehow better, greater, deeper. I'm not saying that. But I am trying to build that into my life where, and I don't, I'm not always successful, but, you know, even before I get out of bed, I just start and say, Lord, this is your day. Thank you for it. Help me through it. I need you. And then I get up, put my slippers on, and start to, I mean, I, I try to have to vote, but when I wake up, I start having that sense of which, Lord, I just want to start by saying, I need your daily bread. I need you. And then go about your day. Fourth, continue discipline. Habits that you want to see happen in your life don't happen overnight. And if you want to find satisfaction, you got to be honest and say, what are the areas of my life that I really need to increase a certain level of habit to to bring satisfaction to my life? And it could be very much this whole area. Of, I, Sean, I don't, I don't have any sense of regular devotional life. Well, then you have to start doing that. If it means getting up 15 minutes before or staying up 15 minutes later or getting 15 minutes off of your social platforms or taking 15 minutes less of a, uh, a lunch break or whatever you do, you have to say, Lord, help me to build godly habits because when you build habits, people think their choices make their life. No, it doesn't. Your habits <laughs> form your ability to make choices. Habits are the things we need to get to. And uh, you can't go climb Mount Everest tomorrow, can you? You have to build the habit of saying, I, I can't even walk down my street. Okay, start there. Walk down your street. And then two weeks later, maybe walk twice down your street. I mean, you just have to start somewhere. And oftentimes you just go, I'm not doing and oh, I can't do this, or I haven't been able to do this. And it's the habit that really generates your choices. Most people think like, well, I, 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 my, my choices. Well, yeah, obviously you choose, but it's not that simple. Your habits form the soil, if you want to look at it that way, for your choices to be made. Anybody want to talk about that? But that's a very important one right there. It's the habits of our life that form the choices we make. Yeah, yeah, I'm not saying I. Or, no, 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 I, I think that's the case. There is a sense in which this day is a gift that you've given to me. Let me live it back as a, an expression of thanksgiving for the gift that I have. Very much so, Don. I wasn't trying to say that. I just, I, I just think there's a sense in which when we get up, we can admit to a dependence upon him for the strength to get through that day. And I think that's where I like to start. And then say, Lord, thank you for this gift. I depend on you. Now help me to be a person who returns my life as a thanksgiving offering for you. Very much so. Very much so. Okay, and last is this. Uh, in times, uh, through God's faithfulness and his grace and his power working in us, it can be an earnest desire to change. And we can honestly say, like the psalmist says over and over and over again, the Lord is my portion. He is my source for all that I need. And I just want to let that be the fifth one where you're saying to yourself, well, I want to have deeper satisfaction, but always know that it is Jesus in you helping you to do these things. And you can, through the power of God's grace, begin to be a satisfied person in Jesus. You can say like the psalmist says, the Lord is my portion. I'm going to come to understand that the Lord is what I need for my life. He is my ultimate need. And when I find him, I find satisfaction for my life. Even if other things aren't, you know, dotted or teed or completed, or you know, even in the mess, Jesus can be our satisfaction. Anybody want to say anything to that? Maybe you're at home and you're saying, I have really gone through that myself. Just let me know in a comment here. Thank you for those that are putting their prayer concerns down and other things. Did you, did you want to say something? Okay, I'm sorry. I thought you put your hand up. No problem at all. Okay. So there are some steps that maybe have helped to you tonight. Let's take a look at Zechariah. 
Now, some of you are going to be saying, Zechariah, uh, wasn't that like, you know, like John the Baptist? Even if you were there, you said, I don't even know who Zechariah is. But he was an Old Testament prophet as well. And if you just go back to Malachi, which is the last book of the Old Testament, and then you just go one book towards the beginning of Scripture, you'll come to Zechariah. So what I'm trying to say is Zechariah is the next to last book of the Old Testament. And in this book, he has a chapter in chapter 14 that talks about the day of the Lord. And uh, this is, has eschatological uh, import to it. And it talks about the day of the Lord. Uh, he starts off in verse 1 of chapter 14, a day of the Lord is coming. And so that's what it's all about. Uh, in, in chapter 14, just go down a, a few verses to verse 6. And it says, on that day, there will be no light no cold, no frost. It will be a unique day without daytime or nighttime, a day known to the Lord. And then look what it says here in verse 8. On that day, living water will flow out of Jerusalem, half to the eastern sea and then half to the western sea. Basically, he's saying water is going to flow all over the world. And Isaiah talks about God's presence covering the whole world as the water covers the seas. And Zechariah is basically saying the same thing. He says in verse 9, The Lord will be king over the whole earth. On that day there will be one Lord and his name, the only name. I know. It is. This is 500 years before the time of Jesus. This is one of the last books of the Old Testament that chronologically was written. And we see that 500 years later, Jesus comes. And on his death and resurrection, he proves that he is the Lord of all. And this kingdom of his has come. And it is alive and well and working around the world. But we're in that period of time where we're the already and not yet. That his kingdom is coming more and more. But there are rival kingdoms in this world. And you know that. But there's a day that's coming fully when this will be realized. And so you see how the Old Testament sets the stage for. And the New Testament looks back and says, you're exactly right, Zechariah. Let me show you what the future is going to hold. And this whole part here about, you know, living water covering the earth and the presence of the Lord covering the earth and The Lord being king, there will be only one king whose name is above all names. You can see where that is just written all over the New Testament, can't you? See, the early followers of Jesus said they knew their Old Testament because most of many of them were Jewish. They knew their Old Testament. So when you see Paul talking about, therefore God gave Jesus the name of his above all names, they just don't again, let's think of something nice and poetic. Uh, Jesus is the name above all names. They just think they knew what the Old Testament had said. They knew Zechariah. And that's the reason they're coupled together. Now let's go all the way to the end of Scripture because there's many in between about the great day of the Lord, but it is a day of judgment, which we should all look forward to when God makes things right. But it is a day not only when God makes things right, but he makes things new. So let's take a look, if we can, at the last book of Revelation. And again, I just want to let everybody who knows this, and maybe you've studied Revelation before, and you said, oh, my word, Pastor, I was part of a small group that studied this thing for two or three years. I was so confused after I got done. We're talking about different animals and different kingdoms and horses, and I'm like, I have no idea. Well, it's a revelation. It's not revelations. It is a revelation of a conquering God who eventually conquers evil and death and brings his kingdom to bear. That's what Revelation is all about. And if you can't keep that in your, how can I say it, in, in your framework for looking at Revelation, you have lost it all. Because if not, you will get despairing, you'll get confused, you'll get scared, you'll be like, if this, I don't have any, I, I got so lost, I'm not even going to even look at Revelation anymore. See what happens? So you go from wanting to know about Revelation to the point where you don't even want to read it anymore. So it's a story of the conquering God who comes to make all things new. That's what Revelation is all about. 
So if we can, take a look at Revelation chapter 7 and verse 17. Are we getting those references up? I appreciate our tech people, and I just want to let them know I appreciate what they're doing. I think they got the last reference up, and I think we'll be okay with this as well. Uh, there is this, uh, and, and again, I don't want to go into the whole great deal, but there is this look at heaven that happens, and let's just take a look at, you know, John's able to see a glimpse of heaven, and we see this um, in verse 15. Is that okay? That They see the throne. They see angels and people standing around the throne. And let's pick up this in verse 15. Therefore, they are before the throne of God and serve him day and night in his temple. And he sits on the throne. I'm sorry. And he who sits on the throne will spread his tent over them. Never again will they hunger. Never again will they thirst. The sun will not beat upon them, nor any scorching heat. Look at this. For the lamb at the center of the throne will be their shepherd, and he will lead them to springs of living water. You see how John puts all these references together in one great vision of the completion of the whole fullness of what God's redemptive work is all about. He will lead them to springs of living water, and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Amen to that? What a beautiful vision that is of what God is going to do for his creation. And I just want to let you know today, the problems and issues of our life are very real, and we're going through a very chaotic time. But God has not given up one iota of his control or his lordship over this world. And one day, he is going to make all things new. And Jesus, the lamb who had looked at he has been slain, is in the center of it all. And he is going to be our great shepherd. Amen to that? What a beautiful vision that really is for us to keep hold of, okay? So that's one picture we have. And let's now turn to the great culmination of the entire revelation that John receives and see how he brings both water and bread and fulfillment, and satisfaction, and all these things together. You, you know, I think many of you have heard me say this, but we always have to keep this in mind because this is where our future is going, and it's Revelation chapter 21. Um, Satan is real. He has now been doomed. All of evil has been doomed. And now that Jesus, what he did on the cross, he broke the power of sin and death on the cross, and now it will be finally judged and done away with. And after that happens, we see what God, then because of the removal of evil, he is now able to bring about his new heavens and his new earth in its fullness. And that's what begins to happen in chapter 21. We okay with that? And it begins, I saw a new heaven, new earth. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem coming down out of heaven. That's verse 2. Verse 3 says, now the dwelling of God is with men. We do go to heaven to be with Jesus when we die, but the ultimate trajectory or direction of where we're going to wind up is here. We are coming back with Jesus when he makes all things new, and we will reign and rule with him in that whole process. I'm going way, way, way overboard on this whole thing. Uh, verse 5, he who was seated on the throne said, I am making everything new. Aren't you thankful for a God who makes us new? And we're going to talk on Sunday morning in our Rise Up series about rising up beyond our regrets because you and I live with regrets as well. And we have to understand that God is making things new. We can even just trust him that, Lord, even through the regrets I've had, you're working your good through it and you're making things new in my life and new for us. Amen to that? God is a God who makes things new for us. Okay, then he says in verse 6, he said to me, John, it is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. And now we get to this whole part again. To him who is thirsty, I will give drink without cost from the spring of the water of life. He picks up all these themes that the Old Testament prophets and that Jesus came to say, I have come to be the fulfillment of it all. I am the Living water, when you drink of me, you'll have water gushing out of me. And what he returns to it. And John says, 
this is going to be the way our lives will be for all eternity. We are going to have fruitfulness and living water flowing out of us. We'll no longer be thirsty anymore. We'll know and see the Lamb who is at the center of all of life. We'll know what it really means to have life. Um, I didn't. I, I think it's okay if I share this. Um, I'm still dealing with the loss of my brother, and you know my brother really struggled with issues in his life. And one of the things that I've really come to understand and trust in, in um, and really come to understand in a deeper way, I believe that my brother trusted in Jesus. But the addictions and the issues and the memories and the experiences that he had gone through were such that he could not get over the deep hang-ups and addiction that he had in his life. And I believe that for the very first time in his life, he is now able to understand that he no longer needs to thirst anymore for the things of life. Jesus can really be the satisfaction of his life. And I'm sorry. Uh, and, and really, I, I, I'm really looking and saying, you know, if it was only for him to catch a glimpse of a God that could help him, this life was worth it for him to then to understand and trust that Jesus can do something greater for him in the age to come. Amen to that? And it's a hard thing because my brother lived a very difficult, hard life. But that I take comfort from the sense, you know, that Jesus can really give people a sense of life, maybe in their death for the very first time of their life. And I trust that for my brother. Well, anyone who thirsts, right? Aren't you thankful for that? Doesn't say church people. It doesn't say people on the right sides of the track. It doesn't say rich people or poor people. It just says, what's it say here in verse 6 again? Let's just read it again. To him, to him, to her, to whoever <laughs> is thirsty, I will give drink without cost. That's grace right there, isn't it? It doesn't cost anything. Just open up your arm and say, I'm thirsty, and Jesus will be there for you. And I, I pray tonight that if you're, I don't know how, you, it's amazing. I, I get comments from people that I'm, I'm listening to this at midnight or I'm driving down the road, wherever, however, and, you know, in whatever position you are to hear this, I hope you're able to hear Jesus' words. To him, to her who was thirsty, just open up your mouth and say, Lord, I need you to quench the needs of my life, and he'll do that for us. Not just now, but this is, a, this is a picture of what our life is going to be like forever and ever and ever, finally knowing what it means to have the deep needs of our life met. Amen to that? Okay, let's go to, uh, okay. Is this, like, uh, is this jazzing you up? I hope it's encouraging. Yeah, I hope it's encouraging us tonight. It's just to say, oh, Lord, thank you so much for your goodness. Okay, now 22, chapter 22, because this is full and final satisfaction in our life. And if we're, if we're unsatisfied here, maybe that's a sense in which we can say, Lord, in this world, in this world, I'm not going to get, I'm not gonna get you know, a full sense of satisfaction. I long for something more. That's a longing for home, isn't it? Uh, I'm going to share in two weeks uh, in our Rise Up series uh, about, uh, you ever heard of the man uh, Tim Keller? He is a pastor. He's a Presbyterian pastor from New York City, uh, the Redeemer. I mean, anyway, last year, he, uh, he's a prolific author, and uh, he found out that he has pancreatic cancer. Obviously, the diagnosis is not good. But he came to the point, I'm going to share this more. I'll just kind of give you a little glimpse. But he came to realize that as he began to not be so earthly minded and really began to put his hopes in the reality that what Jesus promised is true for all eternity, he has now been able to appreciate and enjoy life here better off. But his mind needed to be changed to see what his future promises were. 
And that took the load off of trying to squeeze every bit of satisfaction out of this world because it never meets the need, does it? We just go home and say, oh, Lord, my, my heart yearns for something deeper than this. That's a call to home. And Keller says, when I, when I really came to that grips that Jesus has me for all eternity, it made this life, the days I have left, far better than what they were before. I squandered so many. Now when I get up in the morning, I'm so thankful for every day that I have and anything I go through on that day. It is, it's just a blessing. Okay, so here we go. 22, chapter 22, verse 1 through 5, and then we'll be done here just in a second. Then the angel showed me the river. Here we go again. Zechariah, right? Then the angel showed me the river of the water of life as clear as, clear as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb down the middle of the great street of the city. On each side of the river stood the tree of life, bearing 12 crops of fruit, yielding its fruit. Every, I mean, this, this fruitfulness everywhere. And the leaves of the tree are for the healing of the nation. No longer will there be any curse. The throne of God and of the Lamb will be in the city, and his servants will serve him. They will see his fa- Isn't this beautiful? They, they will see the face, and his name will be on their foreheads. Not literally, but that sense of which the glory and presence of Jesus will be so strong, it will be all over us. We will just know and, and be kind of like in his presence so much, his his name will be written over us. There will be no more night. Remember how back in Zechariah I talked about being not, no need for sun? Well, this says this. There will be not the need. Well, let's go back to the very beginning of verse 5. There will be no more night. There will not need the lamp, the light of a lamp, or the light of the sun. For the Lord God will give them light, and they will reign forever and ever. You see, that harkens right back to what God said to to Adam and Eve. You, with me, rule, have dominion. See, when we say those things, we go, oh, my word, that can be a Well, sure it can be in the hands of broken, sinful people. But when God redeems all things, we're going to be able to reign and to rule with him. And instead of hurting his creation, We're going to be able to bring fruitfulness to all that's done. That's what our future is like. And I just want us tonight to be able to say, oh, Lord, I can live and look forward to that day when I'll be deeply and finally and fully satisfied in your presence. I will see your face. See how important the physical resurrection of Jesus is? Because, as what Paul says, because he lives we will live too. And just like the early apostles saw the new immortal physical body of Jesus, that's our promise as well. The lamb will be in our midst and we will see him and his presence will be such that we'll need not the light of a lamp or even the sun. His glory will be such that we'll be able to live in that presence and reign and rule and create and be the sons and daughters of God that he always wanted for Adam and Eve to be. Amen? You see how this comes full circle? What God created? Oh, yeah, I know. But, Barb, we have to be able to say and to be able to say to other people, because I think I I understand it, and I have no problem. I, I love and respect Billy Graham and all the others. They were concerned to find conversion in the lives of people, so they emphasized the forgiveness of Jesus, which is very important. But if we were to tell the story of a God who can redeem all things in life and bring this beauty to and say, just as he's going to make all things new in this creation, he can do the same thing in your life. See how much more attractive that is? It's a God who can redeem and remake. That's what our world needs to see in Jesus. Not just a God who forgives, but a God who can remake and redeem and overcome our regrets and our problems and make something beautiful out of our life as he's doing in all of his creation. Then we can say to people, that's a story that you can be a part of. Exactly right. Nothing is impossible with God. 
So I just hope this has been a good little series for us to look at and to be able to say to ourselves, oh, Lord, thank you that you can bring satisfaction to my life now. It will be incomplete, but one day it will be full and final, and I'll finally know what life is all about. And a variety of people have said basically this point. When you hear that I've died, don't think (laughs) it's so important. Don't think that I'm dead. I'll be living far more than I ever was before. Amen to that? That's just the reality of what life is all about. Death has been conquered, and our life, it is becoming more satisfied, but in the presence of Jesus, we will finally know what love is. We will finally know what it means to be a human being. We'll finally know what it means to live with a sense of purpose, and we'll be able to live and create and be in the presence of other people that love and be loved, and we can serve and be served, and we can create with one another, and we can live life that he promised to Adam and Eve, but they screwed it all up, but God doesn't trash what he made. He redeems that which he has made, and he has been working through history to bring about this vision, and nothing will stop it. Amen to that? Nothing will stop it. Go right ahead. Exactly right. Exactly right. Yeah. And that's the reason why in the, in the Gospel of John, you see, where do they go? To the garden to see Jesus after his resurrection. John, John says it's a garden tomb. And when the ladies went to the tomb, they thought Jesus was a gardener. See how John goes back and says, just like what God did in creating, you know, uh, Eden, through Jesus, he's doing the same thing again. This God is making all things new, and nothing, Satan, evil, all the evil forces will be able to thwart what God really wants. And that's what Revelation is all about. Don't get wrapped up into all the different beasts, the horses, the thorns, the horns, all these toes. What does that mean, Pastor? Understand this is the culmination of what God is presently doing and one day it will be finally revealed to all to see. Amen to that. That's what Revelation is all about. Well, I hope that leaves you and you say, oh, Lord, thank you again for the reality and the encouragement. You are making all things new. You are making all things new. Tomorrow is the National Day of Prayer. And we're not going to have, uh, we are not going to have like a service here at the church, but I want you to, to leave with two scripture references in mind. And most of you are going to be able to say, and you say, oh, pastor, I know this by heart. But when the temple was made, um, David, you might know this from the Old Testament, David was instructed to build the temple. He passed, and his son Solomon uh, was responsible for actually constructing the temple. We see in chapter 6 of uh, Second Chronicles, uh, he prays this prayer. And remember, the temple was the place where God came to dwell with his people. The temple was the interchange between heaven and earth. And we can see in Second Chronicles chapter 6, just hang with me just for a second, verse 15, or for, verse 18. And Solomon in his prayer says, But will God really dwell on earth with men? The heavens, even the highest heavens, cannot contain you. How much less this temple I have built. Yet, give attention to your servant's prayer and his plea for mercy, O Lord my God. Hear the cry and the prayer that your servant is praying in your eyes. May your eyes be open to this temple day and night, this place of which you said you would put your name there. May you hear the prayer your servants pray towards this place. And he goes on and says in verse 21, Hear from heaven your dwelling place, and when you hear, forgive. That's his prayer for the temple. And then afterwards, they dedicate the temple, and we read these words in chapter 7, verse 13, and you'll know these when I read it, but it says, When trouble comes, or when you fall, when you, when you miss the mark of what I want you to do, he says, When I shut up the heavens, so that there is no rain or command locusts to devour land or send a plague among people. Now, 
there's a, I don't want to go too far into that because I, I just want you to, to say to yourself, does God really want to punish people? That's not his desire. It is what, what Solomon is saying is when the people of God go their own way and serve other idols, there's a consequence to that. God doesn't want to bring any judgment on, or wrath on us in that harsh dictatorial way, but there is a consequence to people living outside of the will of God. And, and Solomon says, even when that happens, even when that happens, he says, if my people who are called by my name will pray, will seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven in this place and I will forgive their sins and I will heal their land. Keep reading. Now my eyes will be open and my ears attentive to the prayers offered in this place. See, he's talking about the temple. I have chosen and consecrated this temple so that my name may be there forever. My eyes and my heart will always be there. Something because what happens in the New Testament, Jesus becomes that temple. And then Jesus says to us, what? Through me, you become a temple of the living God. You become the place where I will meet you and you'll be You'll be that merciful place between heaven and earth, just like the temple was. Jesus became, and then we have become that ourselves. That's why the people of your life need you, because you become that holy place where Jesus resides, and you reflect his glories to earth, and you take the needs of earth and reflect them back to to Jesus. That is why we're the temple of the living God. So tomorrow, as you're living your life, I would ask you, even at home and those here, would you just pray that prayer, Lord, heal our land. Help us to humble ourselves, turn to you, seek your face, and would you bring healing to our land? I hope you'll be willing to do that. The last chapter that I want to read is from the book of Psalm, which is written much later than Second Chronicles, most likely. Uh, there are some that would debate that, but Psalm 80 and I just want to, I don't want to read the whole chapter, but there's this constant, there's a, uh, a repetitious refrain in Psalm 80, and it begins, Psalm 80, verse 1, Hear us, O shepherd of Israel. Jesus becomes that great shepherd, doesn't he? And in verse 3, and in verse 7, and in verse 19, he, he says this refrain over again, and I just want to, Level out, Lord Jesus, heal our land. Help us to turn to you and heal our land because that oftentimes kind of has, well, we got to do this. We got to do it. And there is that part of wanting for God to heal our land. But look what this says. Restore us, O God. Make your face shine upon us that we may be saved. So I just want you tomorrow to say to yourself, Lord, bring healing to our land. And make your face to shine upon us in a new way. Our politicians need to see in a new way the face of God, the reality of God, the truth of God. And God can do that. He needs to turn our families and say, Lord, we need your face to shine upon us. Our country needs it in just the normal towns and squares of life where we've just kind of gone our own way for our own disobedience or our own pride or just we feel discouraged. But we could pray that same prayer, Jesus, make your face to shine upon us that we may be saved. Tomorrow, as we go into our national day of prayer, I hope that you'd be willing to take those two portions of Scripture, 2 Chronicles chapter 7, verse 14, and then Psalm 80, and let those be in your mind as you live your life. And I just would ask that you would just be willing, whatever you're doing, walking to your work, going home, in home, walking down the road, Lord, heal our land. Let your face shine upon us so that we may be saved. Amen to that? Well, let's just uh, take a look. Oh, thank you. So many people. Um, we just need to continue to pray for the people of our church. And I just want to share uh, some here. Brenda, uh, Brenda, Byron needs prayer. 
Lord needs prayer as well. I see that. Let me just share a message from Ken Myers. Uh, some of you know Laura and Ken. Uh, Laura is going to have back surgery. I, yeah. I'm sorry, Laura's having a medical procedure tomorrow, and Ken is having back surgery on the 27th of May. So both of these people need our prayers because they're going through surgery. We have so many people in our church, yeah, and we'll be praying for, you know, for all of these issues. And I pray that, um, you know, as you're just sitting here tonight, maybe you'll say to yourself, oh, this prayer comes to my mind. This person comes to my mind. And if you're online, you just take a moment and just think about the people that are coming to your mind. Let's just pray for a second. Lord, we pray for all the people that you're bringing to our mind tonight. We pray for all those that need your help. Lord, we pray for all those who need your physical help. Bring healing and help. Let people know that you are with them. Lord, we pray for those that are thirsty spiritually, that are just so discouraged or they've chased after the things of this world and that has left them thirsty. Lord, may they, be, have, may they have been encouraged by the words tonight that only you, Jesus, can really fill and take away the thirst of our life. I pray for one who needs to trust you, Jesus, tonight. Let them give you their life. Let them lay down their need or their desire to run their own life. Help them to be willing to die to themselves and to enable you, Jesus, to take control of their life. We love you, Jesus. We pray that you'll be with our country. We pray really that we, we really need to pray for our world. But particularly, we pray for our country. Lord, bring healing to us. Make your face shine upon our political leaders, our spiritual leaders, our moms, our dads, our bosses at work, our neighbors next door, and most importantly, on us. Would you shine your face on us in a new way? We ask that of you, Jesus, tonight. Be with faith community. Help us to be a church that loves cares for, and ministers to really any person. May we be known as a church that literally says to anyone who has thirst, come and find the deep needs of your life met here at Faith Community. Use us, Lord, in that way. We love you tonight, Jesus. We follow you and we'll trust you to meet all the needs of our life. Thank you. And everybody said amen.